let's stand. Trust you. I will trust you. I will trust you, Lord. I trust in you alone. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone, I worthy of my praise. I will give you all my I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. Amen. Psalms 32, 7. You are my hiding place and you keep me from trouble. Isaiah 12, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again to your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave. child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My 
fears were drowned in perfect love You rescued me so I could stand and sing I am a child of God You split the sea so I could walk right through it My fears were drowned in perfect love you rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Lord, we praise you this morning because you help us along in everything we do, Lord. You keep us safe. And you help us when we have fears and, and doubts. We put our faith in you, and we trust you, and we follow you. Work in us this morning. We thank you for your presence this morning. Amen. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you Lord you give life you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only let's worship him this morning give him all the glory we praise you all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord lift your voices all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Great are you, Lord. All 
all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Great are you, Lord. Every time you hear that song, it's like, okay, come on, I can do a little more praising, right? You know, it's his breath. Why do I have to use it all for me? Let's use it some for Jesus Christ this morning. Amen? Well, there's a couple people that are ready to praise the Lord. Anybody else? Well, I think we got everybody now. We're praising the Lord because it's his breath. Because it's his heartbeat that Jesus breathed into us the breath of life. Man became a living soul. We, we, you know, if it wasn't for Jesus, anytime he wants to take that away... Amen. Woo. We've been in uh, John chapters 14, 15, and 16, these last instructions of Jesus before he went to the garden and prayed. And then, uh, well, some of the instruction could have taken place in the garden. And then when he went to the cross, he got betrayed and went to the cross. And they've just been kind of stuck here because he's saying goodbye to his disciples. We've talked about that. Uh, and um, gave good instruction as to what he was doing as he was saying goodbye. And here he shares something very special in, in, in this passage in John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17 that I wanted to share with you today. And I keep thinking, well, we'll move on from this, but you know, we're not. And I'm so glad to have you guys here today. I mean, it looks like we got a group here today. And I appreciate that. Glad you're here and worshiping the Lord. And sometimes we kind of, we've been up and down. And that's okay. Uh, again, if, if you're sick, don't come. <laughs> we really don't want to spread stuff. So uh, everybody's doing their best. And, uh, but we do want to worship the Lord. We do want to worship the Lord. All right, let's stand together as we look at John 15, 9 through 17. Jesus' words, again, these are his words. These chapters are just full of his words, teaching his disciples as he is leaving. He said, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. I preached from that last week, plus from chapter 16. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. Think of that. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, 
But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things I command you, that you love one another. Lord, bless his word. Now, Lord, we thank you for these words of Jesus. We pray that you will again speak to our hearts as disciples of Christ and followers. If there's truths here that stick to us, may you encourage us with this legacy of friendship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You can turn to your neighbor and say, are you a friend of Jesus? And what does your neighbor do? Okay, well, good. As Jesus is saying goodbye to his disciples, he shared something really special. He called these disciples his friends. He said in verse 14, you are my friends. In verse 15, I have called you friends. Now, over the last few years, I have been often impressed to speak on the responsibility that we have to have a real relationship with Jesus. It's probably been 10 years that this has been a kind of a theme running through a lot of my messages because, to me, there's a difference between a relationship and a real relationship. There's a difference between knowing God exists and something else and having a friendship or relationship with him, right? Right? And a lot of people know about God, maybe, or know about Jesus, but do they really have a relationship with him, one that is active? Uh, I think a lot of the problems is relationships come and go so quickly these days. Uh, They just do. And, And so we struggle with understanding what a real relationship with Jesus would look like. And, uh... Here, Jesus is emphasizing this teaching with a special emphasis on friendship. Do you recognize the significance of the word friends? Like I said, we kind of struggle with that. Uh, Have you ever had a real friend? I mean, someone who listens to your problems and doesn't share. (laughs) You know, someone who knows the details of your life. Someone who shares with you their life, their heart, their issues as well. And, you know, you just, you know at a moment's notice, you can call them. And they will stop and listen if they possibly can and give you the time. Now, can you take that kind of friendship and imagine that that friend now has been replaced by Jesus Christ? Is there such a thing as a friend, re, uh, a friend relationship that Jesus can have with us similar to that best friend? I believe there is. What a concept we should have that God actually wants to be your friend. It just kind of stuck out to me this week. More than a friend request kind of neat it could do that i think up in the teen room there's a friend request thing on uh, facebook thing on the on the wall up there and i read it one time you know all he's given all the little details on his life like the friend request would have and whatever in case you were interested but more than that god wants to be not just something out there some information available that you can snoop and kind of look and see if there's a picture of the holy spirit up there or what the mansion in heaven might look like or whatever you know no a friend who really wants to be a part of. By the way, if if we did a friend request and so Jesus accepted and then he looked at your Facebook, what would he see? By the way, he does look. Just a thought. So God wants more than just a friend. He wants to be personally involved in the details of your life. Just like that person you can call and tell them all kind of problems. My mother-in-law gave me a bad lashing this week. 
and they'll take it in and let you unload, and then they'll say, it's okay. I'll pray with you about that or whatever the case may be. But I mean, that kind of friendship where you're personally involved in the details, Jesus wants to be involved. That is a big deal, a huge deal. We used to sing a, a chorus, a song, um, who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing, I am a friend of God. You ever heard that song? I'm a friend of God, I'm a friend of God. You call me friend. And it just goes on. I mean, just to think about that. I and God are friends. What does it mean for Jesus to leave us a legacy of friendship? Well, the first thing that just surrounds this is a shared love. In verses 9 and 10, he said, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down your life for your friends. Verse 17, these things I command you, that you love one another. I mean, shared love, agape love, is the stuff of real friendship. It says, I care so much about you that I will do whatever it takes to keep our relationship going. Jesus even gave his life so that we could have this friendship with him. Christians, however, have heard so much about God's love and that, so, that it sometimes loses its impact, its punch, because the word love is used for hot dogs and pizza and my dog and everything else in life, you know. I just love you. And two minutes later, they love somebody else. But we have a friendship with agape love of Jesus Christ. It's not just I care about you to see what you can give me in a relationship. It is I love you so much I already went ahead and died for you before you were even born. I love you so much. You'll never find a love like Jesus. You will never find a love. Now, we've got a couple in our church that's got this puppy love thing going on. I mean, nobody else has noticed, I'm sure. But there is a love with Jesus Christ that's deeper and more special and really available all the time. Of course, the agape has to be reciprocated by both people in the, in, in the love relationship in order to make it work. And there is no true friendship if a human ignores the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. If we ignore that, there is no friendship. If people do not buy into what Jesus has done and how much he has loved them, then there will never be no reciprocated love. It takes both. For it to work. But Jesus shares his love anyway, whether or not it is returned. Jesus died for all anyway. He shared his unconditional love regardless of whether it was accepted or not. That is why the failure of spiritual friendship falls uh, totally on the shoulders of the sinner. So I don't feel the love of Christ. He's done all he can do. It's the fact you have not responded is why you don't feel the love of Christ. And Jesus called on his followers, us, to love as he loved. Love one another. Agape one another. Share my love with this quality to someone else. It is his command that we agape one another. So a shared love is the first thing. And his legacy of friendship also includes his gift of joy. Verse 11, it says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy might be full. And we talked about that. 
Thank God for his gift of joy, which helps us through the good and bad times of life. And that was last week's sermon, so we're going to move on to number three. His example of self-sacrifice. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. God's love for us is so great that he sent Jesus to earth to die for our sins. Jesus, agape for us, is seen by his death on the cross. Jesus died for you and I so that we can be one of his friends. You can be a friend to Jesus Christ. Wow. He loves you. And our love for Jesus can also mean that we might be asked to give our lives for Jesus. Greater love is no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, he said. So, I mean, there may be that time, and many Christians over the years have paid the ultimate price for their friendship and commitment to Christ. They value their relationship with Jesus more than life itself, and it's still going on today. Thousands of Christians die every year because they are Christians. It may come to America someday. It may be here sooner than we realize, but it's sure happening around the world. How many soldiers, how many first responders have given their lives for others? We have Veterans Day. We have Memorial Day. We have things to re remind us of those who have given their lives the ultimate sacrifice because they had friends that they thought it was worth laying down their life for. Thank the Lord for them. There is a level of love and loyalty where self-sacrifice becomes necessary. And Jesus is the ultimate example of that. He is the example of self-sacrifice because he came to a world that many did not receive him. But he still died anyway. The fourth thing is our obedience. How do we respond to this ag God's agape love and his friendship? We do so through our obedience. We must obey because he loves. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, many people struggle with the concept of obedience today, but just, just think about this because there's a big law and order debate going on. In order for a society to function at all, there's going to have to be rules. Sorry. I know, I know we want a whole life without rules that I can do whatever I want. My dad used to say you can swing your fist as much as you want and have all the fun you want, but when it comes in contact with my nose, Right? There comes a point in time where you can do anything and whatever you want, but if there's other people, because no man is an island, there is other people around, and they have rights as well. So if we have a society without rules, there's no society. It's chaos. And we've already seen that happen in certain zones that have been set up. So if you're going to have rules in a society, then there must be consequences for those who break the rules or the rules are meaningless. What's the use of saying you should not steal if when people go and steal, there's no consequence? Well, that just tells them steal some more. If we're just letting people back out who bash in windows and steal and loot and don't do anything about it, then what is the consequence? Why should they stop? That's good preaching. Now, 
But God is different in that he does not force everyone to follow his rules. He made the rules. He created the universe. He set it up and said, if you want to really enjoy life, if you really want to live this thing the best it possibly can, I've got a set of rules for you people to follow. And it works. The problem we have is, like a lot of our governors and and mayors, they don't enforce the rules. Jesus said, okay, I'm going to give you guys a break. And chance after chance after chance after chance. Well, I wish God wouldn't have done that. What? I'm glad God did that or I wouldn't be here. And neither would you, for all have sinned. God gave us chance after chance after chance because of his grace. The problem is we become grace abusers. We have a society that's a grace abuser. We have Christians that become grace abusers. Well, I can just go ahead and sin because God's going to forgive me. Well, that's a dangerous way to live. See, God hasn't forced everyone to follow his rules. Instead, he allows us to run our own lives as we wish, but he keeps calling from the cross, and he's saying, follow me. Do it my way. Obey my rules. Obey my commands. And Jesus said, if you're going to be my friends, you've got to obey my commands. We don't earn God's friendship because we are obedient, however. That is living by the law. The Pharisees were good at living by the law, or they tried. But we're not living by the law in that sense as Christians. We're living by grace because none of us could live by the law good enough, and we would have all been sinners. We would have died. Thank God for grace. So we don't earn his friendship by being obedient. No, our obedience is the evidence that our friendship with God exists. We have a relationship with him. That's why we obey. you got to do it the right way. You just don't, oh, I'm going to obey God. That will make me his friend. No, you've got to be a Christian, and then you want to obey God. There's a big difference. You cannot earn your way to heaven. you got to come to the cross and surrender your life to him, and then what? Then you want to obey him. I want to please my friend. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want him to have to die on the cross again for me. It's enough. I don't want to crucify him afresh. I've already did that. He's my friend. I don't want to abuse his grace. When we think who God is, the creator, the designer, the giver of human life, then it only makes sense that he knows the best way for me and you to live. And God has a purpose for every human life, even yours. And your life will be the best it can be only when you follow his will. And so many people are missing it. Well, I become a Christian and I'm going to do whatever I want. No, that's not the best way to live. The best way to live is to find out what God's will and plan is for your life and jump in it and give him everything you can in obedience to his will for your life. That is the best way to live. It'll save you from a whole lot of heartache, a whole lot of wrong turns, a whole lot of bad habits. God wants you to grow. We all come to him with baggage, but we release that baggage at the foot of the cross And then we re-release it sometimes because some of them are a little harder. But we get to the point where we finally say, I am through. I'm done. I'm going to follow my creator, my designer, my life giver. And he knows what's best for me. Because he has a plan and purpose for every one of you. Don't you want to follow that? I know you do. That's part of being a friend. So it's not a terrible injustice for us to obey God. In fact, it is an injustice for us to ignore God's plan. Because when we do, we're ignoring God's best for our lives. Are you happy with second best? 
I mean, Debbie was God's best for me. What if I'd have settled for a Sarah or a Rachel or somebody else? You know, I'm glad I got God's best. And I want God's best in the other areas of my life as well. Life goes better when we're in the center of his will and make our decisions according to his will. To do our own way, to go your own way, is to destroy friendship with God. To obey him is to help your friendship grow. Remember, this is a friendship. God only wants the best for you. He's not telling you these things to make your life miserable. He's telling you these things to keep your life good. Now, you know if you go to that place, you're going to get in trouble. You know if you say those words, you're gonna... he tells us, he warns us, he's got our best interest in mind. And old hard-headed, I'm going to do it anyway. And then we wonder why we end up running into the brick wall again, falling into that pit of sin again. Why? Because we're not listening, we're not obeying. He wants only the best for you. The reason we need to obey is because he's our best friend and he wants to keep us out of trouble. He's given us some pretty good advice. Isn't he the one that showed you how to get freedom from sin? Victory over your temptations, regular spiritual growth. In fact, anything that will make our friendship better, Jesus offers it to you and he guides you that way. And he says, come on, come on, we can do this. Together we will make it. I am your friend. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. Which reads directly leads directly to the next point, number five, an understanding of God's will. Verse 15, no longer do I call you servants or slaves, doulos is the actual, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now, you got to get this. This powerful verse. God, as king, could force humans to do his will. We could all be slaves. You come to the cross, ask Jesus in your heart, and then you just march out and do whatever he tells you to do the rest of your life. He could have done that. We could be spiritual slaves because, as he said, servants obey the commands of the king or, or the master without usually knowing the reasons behind why they do what they do. I mean, he just says, just like the army, the sergeant says, go, and they go. They follow him into battle. Take that hill. The lieutenant says, take that hill. And the sergeant finds a way. You two guys go over this, or you guys go this way. And he could have done that. But God didn't want us to be just slaves. He wanted us to be his friends, not servants. So Jesus began to share with his followers, this is what the Father's plan is. Before the foundation of the world, God sent forth his Son, made under woman, made under the law, to redeem us. I mean, he begins to share. What's he doing for three chapters here? I'm going to leave you. I'm saying goodbye. And yet, I want you to know this is what's going to happen. He shares with his people his plan. There is no doubt that most of us know what is going on. How many have heard about the second coming of Jesus? How many have heard about Jesus dying on the cross? How many have heard about his resurrection? How many have heard about his ascension? Many, we know the plan. So Jesus and God 
and the Holy Spirit living inside of us have led us in on the spiritual secrets. We know why Jesus died. We know about Satan and sin and to stay away and to fight against them. They're the enemy. And we now know God's truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We, we spent 15 sermons on the truth. So why do I obey God? Because Jesus has helped me understand that my life will be best if only and when I surrender to God's plan for my life. And he has revealed that plan to me. He says, I want to help you grow in this area. I want to help you do this ministry. I want to help you become better at this. I want you a better father, a better husband, a better leader, a better pastor. I want to help you. And I said, okay, God. And as I shared with you last week, there's times when I do this. But he keeps coming along and saying, come on, right? Because he has a plan. And he has shared it. Why do I obey God? Because Jesus has helped me understand that my life will be the best it can be only when I surrender to his plan. Why do I obey God? Because Jesus is my best friend, and he is sharing with me the secrets to spiritual living. In this sinful world, there's a way in which we can live, where we can be in the world, but not of the world. And Jesus shares that with us because we're his friends. This isn't a secret society where we don't know what's going on. This is an open book society where Jesus has shared, and, and God the Father has shared, and the Holy Spirit is sharing what the plan is. Which leads us to the sixth one, a call to fruitful service. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain. <laughs> and this is tying into the first of the of the chapter where he talks about, I'm the vine, you are the branches, and you're to bear fruit and pruning and all that stuff. But this is another powerful sentence because in Jesus' day, and I'm starting with these words here, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit. You think about that. In Jesus' day, those who wanted to learn chose a rabbi to follow. Some chose to follow John the Baptist. Paul said at the foot of Gamaliel, I mean, you chose a rabbi, and whether he was accepting leaders or not, or followers, and then you walked around with him and you learned from him. You chose the person. He said, can I, can I go to your school? Can I learn in your synagogue? Can I be your little follower? But Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you. Jesus says something drastically different here than what they would have done in their society. He chose Peter and James and John. He chose you to follow him. Think about that. Because God sees in you a great potential. He sees in each one of you a worthy to be dying on the cross for you. And he sees in you that you can be freed from your sins and you can do some ministry in the name of Jesus. He chose you. Wow. That's big stuff. Well, I choose to follow Jesus and, and he's going to tag along after me and do whatever I want. No. He chose me. It's my job to follow him. Jesus has called you to go and bear fruit. Now, there are some people in this world that only you can reach, that only you can help. No one else in the church will be there at that moment in time when you confront or meet or greet or they call you up and say, can you help me? You're a Christian. Can you pray with me? You will be the person that God will channel through to bear fruit. They may not become a Christian because of you directly, but indirectly you are helping them. You're planting seeds. You're watering. You're fertilizing. You're doing whatever it takes. You will be a part of bearing fruit. God is asking you to reach out in love to that person 
and to show him and her a better way to live. And because God chose you, your ministry will be successful. You work at sharing Jesus will help someone to Christ and your fruit should remain. That's because when we pour ourselves into a person and they become Christians, guess what? Most Christians like it. Most Christians stay Christians. There's a few that go back, but most... Uh, People, I don't know what a percentage is, stay Christians because they realize it's a better way. You get a taste and see that the Lord is good. It's like the prodigal son. He gets to the pig pen and then says, you know what? I'd rather go back to the father's house. Because there's something about the father's house. There's something about unconditional love. There's something about that just draws you back in. Now, the Japanese are known for growing trees in little pots. I mean, some of these trees, if they would have been planted outside, would have, right? But they put them in these little pots so there's nowhere for the roots to go. They don't fertilize them. They withhold water from them sometimes. And they, any little bud that comes, they go, Right? They keep it miniature. They take great pains to keep the trees starved and stunted. They clip off the tender buds. Fertilizers with health. The tree that could grow and should and produce remains a dwarf, some of them for hundreds of years. And they got this huge tree that could be in a little pot inside their house. Jackie recently gave Debbie a grapefruit tree in a cup about this size. And I'm like, what good's a grapefruit tree if it's growing in your house? It's like plant a strawberry plant in your house. And, oh, I got three strawberries this year. Woohoo! But people do that, and it's okay. The tree that should grow and produce remains a dwarf. And ladies and gentlemen, that is not God's plan. That's not how he wants your life to... Many Christians got this idea, well, I'm a Christian, I'm going to stay in the little hothouse, in my little tiny pot, and I'm going to become root round in here, and I'm never going to produce, I'm just going to be for the master to look at, and maybe he'll be happy with me and come along. And... No, that's not the purpose of bearing fruit. God's plan is that you get out of the pot and out of the house and out into the world and actually get planted and rooted and grow and produce and bear fruit. God chose you to grow your fruit to your full potential. God wants Christians to minister and not just to the people in the house, but the fruit needs to fall off the tree and hit some of those sinners on the head. And they need to go, wow, that's good stuff. They need to get a good, ripe one. I mean, one that hits them and goes squirt, and the juice just gets all over them. They need to come in contact with you and just get God's love squirted everywhere. Amen. Amen. People say, what happened to you? You look like you had a big old stain. Well, I ran into this Christian, <laughs> and he squished stuff all over me. And now I just kind of look like this until I decide to come to Jesus and get my life squared away. Amen. Right? God chose you to grow. Get out of the little pot and out of the house. Get out there. Grow and produce. One of the blessings of being Jesus' friend is connecting with other people who then become friends with Jesus, and then you even have more friends. Number seven, another blessing of our friendship with Jesus is answered prayers. <laughs> Jesus finished with the promise in verse 16 that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give. may give you. 
Prayer, of course, you know this, is communicating with our friend. You may see it as communicating with this austere individual sitting on the throne somewhere, and it is, but it goes through Jesus, who was here. He's the intercessor. He's the advocate that sits at the right hand of the Father. He is the paracletos. He is, he is the helper. He helps us with this. And the Holy Spirit as well. We're communicating not with just some king who doesn't know us, but we're communicating with our friend. And God cares about his friends. And when a Christian asks him for something and the request lines up with God's will, if we pray in his name, the name of Jesus, that means I'm lining it up with your will, Lord. I'm not forcing you to do anything, but I'm asking you, if it's your will, God, please answer this request. Then our Heavenly Father delights in answering our prayers. As the songwriter said, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Right? Yeah. And then, then there's another verse that says, can, can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows my every weakness. Jesus knows my every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. We got a friend who's not sitting up there and saying, oh, bad prayer. <laughs> he loves you. And he cares about your request in your needs. So this passage has a tremendous message. God wants to be your friend. He died to be your friend. Greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus wants to be intimately involved in the details of your life, and God has done everything he could in his power to make our friendship work. Have you accepted? Jesus wanting to be your friend, his friend request to you? Most of you would have to say yes. Then, the second question is, don't you want every other person in your life to experience this kind of friendship with God? And you say yes. So I guess it's time to hop out of our little pot, even though we're 100 years old and have been in there our entire life, maybe it's time to get out and drop some fruit on somebody. Because they need that friendship as well. So if I was a millionaire, I'd give you all a bonsai tree this morning. <laughs> or if I was Jackie, I'd give you a grapefruit tree. And then tell you, take it out and plant it. And let it grow. For Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. So this morning, as we have family altar time, come and talk to your friend. Why not? You'll hear and understand and respond better than any other person in your life. He's really good at keeping secrets. And he already knows what your problems are. And he's probably laid someone on your heart that you need to befriend for Jesus. These are all good things to pray about. So as the praise team comes...
Let's pause a moment, prepare our hearts. Lord, as we move to family altar time, we're just asking you to be the friend of sinners because you're already also the friend of Christians, but we pray that both will take place now. In these next few moments, may our friendship with you get stronger. May we get closer. And Lord, may we grow. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and mind the Lord. Hungry I come to you For I know you said Continue our prayer time this morning by just turning ourselves to you and saying, you do satisfy. We are hungry and thirsty. We, we want more. It's, it's, it's a desire of every Christian's heart to just be a better friend to Jesus. And we find that we can't outfriend you. You're always, you're always better at it than we are. And so, Lord, we're just constantly reaching out and saying, give me more. Help me to grow. Help me to do better. And Lord, you're just so patient. 
So, Lord, make us patient as we deal with others that are struggling. And help us, Lord, to, to have grace to others just as you've had grace to us. And help us, Lord, to befriend others just as you have befriended us. And help us, Lord, to share the fruit that you give to us so it doesn't just rot on our tree, but it actually gets out there and produces fruit in the lives of others. Lord, there's a lot here to, to pray about, but we just want to pause and say thank you for being our friend. Thank you, Lord, for giving your life. Thank you, Lord, for making the ultimate sacrifice for us. And so now, Lord, we come in obedience to you because we know it's the best way for us to live. The best way is to follow you and your commands for our lives. So we say yes to you today. We're a little better today. <laughs> we're going to grow a little bit more today. You're going to teach us, and we're going to say yes. We're going to follow. Thank you for that. Now we pray, Lord, for those that are sick and hurting amongst us. Uh, we lift up Mary Sue, and there's many others. We hate to mention names because we always forget one or two. But our nursing home uh, friends and those that have not come back yet because of their reasons, whatever they may be, and those that are hurting and our children in school and our teens and the adjustments that many of our people are making to life today. And so we would pray for our country and we would pray, Lord, for our state and our leaders for our country and our state and our town. And Lord, we would pray that there would be an influx of common sense and there would be a reality shift to know that God is the way, the truth, and the life. And so much that's being spread out there and spread is not necessarily the truth. We pray again, Lord, for truth to permeate our land. We're asking, Lord, for people to quit lying to us. And we're praying, oh God, that somehow truth would be given out across our nation. Lord, we need truth more than we need anything else. Right now, as a country, we need truth. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we worship you for the remainder of this service, and we go out this week to serve you and to bear fruit. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.
his heart, O oh God, completely to you. So what can I say? What can I do? announcement and that is as you're exiting offering plates are in the back do not forget that and uh, just want to continue to remind you to look around someone who's missing call them up give them encouragement everybody likes to hear encouragement right and uh, let them know that you miss them that you care about them and and uh, let's lift each other in prayer let's be the disciples of Jesus Christ right we got a world out there and the world out there is messed up but we have the answer. His name is Jesus. Let's worship one more song. We like this one. We're doing it again. I will worship. I will worship. With all of my heart. With all Trust you alone. Trust in you alone. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my you alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. 
Have a good week, everybody.